certain relief pitchers. You know, certain relief pitchers that they use when they're ahead and certain relief pitchers when they're losing. Um, for college coaches, it's much more of a dilemma. It's especially a dilemma on Friday because, you know, do you use your top relief arms if you're behind on Friday? Um, because if you never come back and tie the game or take the lead and you use up your, your best arms just to keep the game close that you, that you may end up losing. And now you put yourself at a disadvantage in a game that you potentially could win the next day or the day after that. Is that the most prudent route to take? And there's been plenty of times when I've taken that route, believe me. A lot of times it's because you're, you have such a good offensive team that you believe that you can overcome the deficit or because the other team's pitcher is the kind of pitcher that you think you can get to or the conditions are such, you know, the wind's gailing out and you feel like you can, you can eventually score enough runs for your team's really swinging the bats in a, you know, in a, in a, in a very confident and hot way, you know. Um, but the other night on, on Friday night, you know, the wind was galing in. I didn't think, you know, we were going to be able to get a guy on and boom, blast a two run homer because it just seemed like it was going to be impossible to hit a home run that night. And, um, you know, so I didn't want to go to our pen and use our top guys. And, uh, you know, so I tried to get a little extra out of, out of, uh, um, out of Jade and I probably left him in you know, probably two batters too long. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have sent him out there for the eighth inning at all. He was at 85 pitches after seven innings. I thought he still had it. I didn't think I was putting him in any kind of danger physically, and I thought he was still throwing the ball well. The first batter got a fairly legitimate hit. The second batter on a 3-2 pitch just kind of stuck his bat out and hit a weak ground ball you know, through the hole between the shortstop and third baseman. I probably could have taken him out right there, but I thought, you know, if he could get this guy and also face Hancock, who I thought was their one power threat, and plus the wind, if there was going to be a ball hit out, was going to have to be right fielder to the line, which is what Skinner had done earlier in the game. And I really wanted Jaden to face Hancock if we could, could have that happen. Well, then... The kid hits a bloop single, and um, so I have him face Hancock. He gets Hancock to pop up, so then I bring in McHale, and McHale does his job, really, through a first pitch strike, and the catcher uh, ambushed it and, you know, hit a ground ball that found a hole. You know, if the ball's 20 feet more to this side, it's a double play ball, but, you know, in baseball, sometimes they find the holes, sometimes they're right at people. And it found a hole and it was a two run single. And, you know, all of a sudden we're down by, you know, down by uh, four. Uh, but Mikhail, I thought, threw the ball good after that. It was probably his best curveball he's had all year. And, um, you know, I, I, thought he, I thought he did okay. And, you know, the next night I thought uh, we brought in um, uh, Kaminer and he got the left hander out. Um, you know, Will Helmers, uh, you know, he walked the leadoff batter outside of that. You know, I thought he threw the ball good. He got a big strikeout. Um, he, he uh, you know, had a bad luck when the runner moved to third base on a ball in the dirt and then scored, you know, on an infield hit. And then, of course, yesterday, I thought our bullpen was terrific with, with Ty Floyd and, and, and Fontenot. So, you know, if, if, we, if we're limited to the guys – you know, the first four or five guys, you know, I feel really good about our bullpen. You just got to be in the game and have a chance to win to be able to use those guys. Thanks, back to me. Paul, is this, of course, if y'all are able to get the game in tomorrow, be the first time y'all played two lanes since 2018. So does this mean that the home and home is coming back? Um, or is it still kind of up near what might happen moving forward after this year? Well, we we've have agreed to play home and away, but alternate years. So we're only playing one game a year and we just alternate the sites each year. So our home game got canceled last year. So this year we're going to play there. And if the game gets canceled, the next year we'd be back at our place in 22. So, um, but we're going to still keep our fingers crossed and hope that we can get this game in. OK, 
Okay, uh, Jack, you're up. Hey, Coach, how's it going today? It looks like we're about 24 hours after our first series. I just want to know, what were you most proud of of your team after your first conference series? Well, obviously, there's a big difference between going 0-3 and 1-2. and and I know everybody's disappointed that we didn't win the series. All of us are, the players, the coaches, certainly the fans are. Um, but when you're 0-2 and staring at a possibility of losing all three, winning that final game is very critical. The big difference between going 0-3 and, and 1-2. And so, you know, when you go home on Saturday night and you, and you you know, you've scored one run in two games against a, a extremely strong pitching staff and you know you're facing a guy throwing 96 miles an hour the next day, you know, you're, you know, you <laughs> You don't have to use a lot of imagination to think the worst thing that could happen. And, you know, our guys came out and competed really hard. I was so proud of A.J. Labus for giving his team a chance to win. And then, you know, we scratched for a couple runs there in the first inning. It wasn't anything to, you know, you know, to write a, a, a book about. You know, we didn't even get a hit in the first inning, but we showed a good eye and drew a couple walks and, Dylan Cruz with two strikes, put a ball in play to be able to advance the runners. Their pitcher threw a wild pitch to allow a run to score, but then Gavin Dugas, you know, which we didn't do the day before, put a ball in play. He put a ball in play and scored the runner from third base. So situational hitting there got us a second run. So we gave up the lead. The score got tied, but then I thought Gavin Dugas came through with a just a huge home run for us. As important a home run as we've hit all year, and we've hit several home runs, as you know. And then what I was really proud of, too, was, you know, that, you know, Trey Morgan, who's been struggling, came through with a really big RBI hit, hustled it into a double. Then um, um, Brody Dross, who had been having a hard, a really, really tough day, got two strikes on him and then hit the big home run. Uh, later on, we got a big two-run double from Jordan Thompson. Uh, you know, the bullpen was terrific. I mean, there were a lot of things to be proud about yesterday and a lot of things to build upon. And I know, I know I use a lot of cliches, but um, these were just three games out of 30. So whether you win a series, lose a series, you know, at the end of the day, they all count the same in a 30 game schedule. So if, you know, you go out and you sweep somebody that people didn't expect you to sweep or you win a series that people didn't expect you to win, then you made up for not winning a series at home, so to speak. So at the end of the year, you, you're going to look at the final standings you're not going to look at each individual series and say well they won this series or lost this series and that's that's the goal you know so you know this was one in the win column and uh it feels a lot better than if we were having this press conference sitting here being 0 and 3 i can assure you there's still a lot of baseball to play this year we got a lot of big games ahead of us you think about opening up this this sec schedule what was tennessee ranked 13th going in i mean uh Mississippi State was ranked thir 13th going into yesterday. No, I mean, a third third or second. Next week, we play Tennessee, who I think is ranked 11th today in the poll. And then we play Vanderbilt, who's ranked number one in the poll. I mean, you think about this league. It's you, There's no time to feel sorry for yourself. It's a very unforgiving league. So all you can do is pick yourself up off the ground and get ready for tomorrow. And that's the way you got to approach it. You want to sit around and feel sorry for yourself you're, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be in for a tough time. So I was really proud of our guys that they got up off the ground uh, after losing two in a row and came back and played a really a good, good, solid game. I thought they played really good baseball all weekend. We just didn't hit enough in the first two games. It's really, really that, that simple. We made a couple little mistakes here and there that in a, in a low-scoring type ball game can make the difference between winning and losing. Back to Glenn. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, coach, you know, you mentioned the, the lineup. We know you've been tinkering a lot with that this year, but this was, you know, kind of the first time we got to see Morgan in that leadoff spot and Cruz in that three hole. I'm just you know, curious for your initial impressions of just kind of the, the new look. And um, also just was the K Beloso thing just kind of a day off for him, just a chance to regroup. Do you expect him to be back uh, very soon? Yeah. Well, you know, K, there's no secret that Cade's been struggling and, um, you know, I've stuck with him. I've stuck with him through hell and high water, you know, all year. And he's, he's really been struggling and he's a, he's a veteran guy and a great competitor. And he's been a great hitter his freshman year. He had 11 home runs, but 
I just felt that after Saturday night, he was in such a rut that he just wasn't ready to to give us anything on Sunday. And I thought maybe Brody could give us a spark and he certainly did with the two run homer. But I, I actually just came in from the field. You know, I met with Cade this morning and he, we just had a little private session with him on the field, made some adjustments with him, with his mechanics. And uh, he just had the best batting practice he's had in several months, really. Um, I'm not I'm not giving up on Cade below, so I can assure you of that. And, and uh, the kid is a great competitor and I know what he's capable of doing. We went back and, and looked at a lot of video from his freshman year and compared it to the video of this year. And, and really there were several things that, that jumped out to me. And, you know, I, I took a lot of initiative in, in, in showing these things to, to, to he and Eddie. And, and we, we worked at it, worked on it as a group and, you know, try to make those adjustments. Now batting practice is certainly different than being in there and facing 93 miles an hour. Um, but I just feel that, that we, we were on to something and that Cade feels better about himself today than he did a couple days ago. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure what the lineup will be like our next game, but um, I can assure you I'm not giving up on Cade Veloso. And I, I, don't, I don't think we can win a championship, to be honest with you, without Cade Veloso being a major factor in it. So, um, you know, let's hope that he turns it around for the Tigers and for himself. Hey, Coach, you were you were talking about A.J. Labus's performance yesterday, and I think Landon Marso's earned run or streak is now at 31 innings without giving up an earned run. Like, when you see those guys go out there and pitch that way, and Labus got his first win of the year at like, do you think that, like, that just speaks to the competitiveness of this pitching staff and then you throw in Jade Hill? Like, how really competitive are these guys, even though they're not getting statistically the wins that they would like to? Well, when you think about it, okay, A.J.'s first start of the year against Louisiana Tech, if I'm not mistaken, Bill, I don't think he made it through the third inning. Right. I think, I think he had given up, like, nine or ten hits and six runs, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And then, of course, Jaden Hill had that game against um, Oral Roberts where he didn't make it out of the first inning. But if you eliminate those two outings through the first five weekends of the season, every start that our, those three guys have given us, 13 starts have been more than just a, what you would call a quality start, exceptional starting starts. I mean, winning games starts they should have all been win wins in their column for the starting pitchers but for whatever reason they weren't whether we blew the leads or we didn't hit enough or whatever okay so all of those guys really should have four wins and marso should have five wins and is on their stats uh if we would have just done the job behind them in in whatever ways that that's that blows me away really i mean I've had staffs before that have pitched like that, and it's remarkable when, you, when you're fortunate enough to have starting pitching like that. And all I can hope is that it just continues because it's, it's great when you can sit there in the dugout and know that your starting pitcher can go out there and give you six innings, six to seven innings, and have your team right there in the ball game. And then it's just up to the rest of the guys to figure out a way to win those last three innings of the game. And uh, that's the job of the starting pitcher. And if we can keep getting that, Matt, then, then we're going to be in good shape. Uh, I feel confident. You know, that's when, it, you know, like Glenn asked me about the bullpen earlier. And I feel confident that our bullpen is going to be good enough. And I feel confident that our defense will be good enough. And I feel confident that our hitting will be good enough. You have to believe that. But at the end of the year, when we evaluate the season, it'll be how we performed in those late innings. And how we did in the close games and the one run games, two run games, the close games will determine what the final result of our season will be. Coach too. I wanted to, I wanted to quickly ask you about, um, I don't think the term wipeout changeup has been used, but anyone for Jaden Hill this year, I mean, can you, how much work has he done with that pitch? Because honestly, coming into this year, me personally, I thought the slider was a little bit better, but now, 
I don't think anyone's gotten a hit off that pitch all, all year off him. Yeah. Well, you know, Matt, um, you, you haven't seen him as much as I have, but he's always had that good changeup. He came out of high school with that really good changeup. His slider has been more of a development pitch that he's developed here under Allen during his time at LSU. And his slider has been a little bit more inconsistent when it's been good. It's been really phenomenal, but it, there's been times when it's been a little inconsistent. The last two games, Allen has kind of forced Jaden to throw it more. And I think that's been a really good thing because he's found a feel for it and he's, and it's really developed. That slider's really coming along, but he's always had that change up and that's been a real bread and butter for him. And it's a been, a, I think it's a really, it's a major league change up. And uh, um, I'll tell you, we're really fortunate because Marso and Labus have really outstanding change ups as well. And that's, a, that's what I think makes all three of them good starting pitchers, great starting pitchers, is the fact that they can all throw three pitches at any time for strikes, and they're all plus pitches. I wouldn't say Lavis's fastball necessarily is a plus pitch. You know, it's 89, 90 miles an hour. But because he can throw his slider and his changeup whenever he wants to, he can sneak that fastball in on people. Whereas Marceau's fastball is not as hard as Hill's, but it's got such great movement and he's got such great command of it. Jaden's is harder than everybody else's, probably doesn't have quite the movement. But, you know, all of them have those three pitches. And I think that's what makes them all really competitive guys. And uh, the one outing that Jaden had bad, I think that we probably tried to use his fastball too much and not mix his pitches as well, which you have a tendency to do when a guy throws so hard. You want to try to just force people to hit his fastball and when when you do that um you know they're gearing up for that fastball they hear they hear about him you know a top prospect he throws 96 miles an hour guys come out of the dugout saying i'm going to hit that fastball and when you just keep trying to throw it by him sometimes they can hit it and i think these last two outings alan has really adapted and started throwing the other pitches right out of the gate he started calling the game like you would call it for marso or labus and I think that's helped Jaden Hill a lot. Well, uh, any, uh, is Gio okay after getting hit on the knee yesterday? Is that why y'all had to pull him there? Or was it the base running mistake that you wanted to make the change? Actually, it was neither. His hamstring uh, aggravated yesterday. So that's why he got pulled. Yeah. And then another question, if I could, real quick, with Collier, you, you said that you know he was a major storyline for you throughout the weekend. What did you like so much about what he was able to do at second base? Oh my gosh, I just thought he played terrific. They had six left-handed hitters in their order, and and he had, well, I know he had six chances the first game. I don't remember how many he had in the second or third game, but his range at second base was terrific. And I thought the key play in yesterday's game was when Hancock kind of smoked that ball to his left and. Collier started the double play to end the inning. It was around the fifth or sixth inning, if I'm not mistaken. That was a huge play in the ball game. And uh, the night before, with Marceau pitching, he ranged to his right on a ball that was hit up the middle, and he backhanded the ball and got the force out at second base to end the inning. And he just was very confident in handling all the chances out there at second base, and, and there were a lot of them. And uh, I think it just really – gave a lot of confidence to our pitchers. It gave a lot of confidence to our coaching staff, that's for sure. And, you know, things that most fans and media probably just take for granted, you know, the routine plays. Sometimes they're not so routine in college baseball. I promise you that, you know, finding infielders that can just make the routine plays and especially at second base, having a little bit of range. It's not, it's not a given, you know, and I think Collier, went out there and, and he actually had some really good at bats too. You need to work with him on his bunting a little bit, um, fortunately, but um, I, he, he got a nice base hit one time. Another time he smoked the ball. Unfortunately, they turned it into a double play. Um, you know, he, you know, but he drew, I think he drew a walk or two. I thought Collier really played, played good baseball all weekend, really solid baseball. Like I thought he played like he played last year for us when he played shortstop those 10 games really proud of him you know he's kept a good attitude when he hasn't been playing and we talked last week and I told him you know that his his chance is going to come again he's just got to keep a good attitude and keep working hard and it's I just love those stories when guys you know 
seem to be down and out and and yet you, you call on them and they're ready for their opportunity again instead of pouting and feeling sorry for themselves or quitting or giving up or being mad at the coach or whatever and then when you put them back in they're ready look at Mitchell Sanford you know he he, he gets benched after Friday night's game after striking out three times, Giovanni gets put in there. Giovanni's hamstring gets aggravated. You put him in the game, he steps in and gets a, a double and a single in his two at-bats yesterday. Uh, I just love those those kids that are, do those kinds of things. They're, they're so special to me. You know, it's, it's great to be an everyday player. It's great to be Dylan Cruz or Trey Morgan, you know, where everything seems to come easy to you. But those kids that, you know, get knocked down and, don't give up and keep keep battling and then do something something they they hold a special place in my heart hey coach just got one more quick one for you um you know i know i just wanted to get your thoughts on you know just what you thought of the uh the move to put morgan first in the lineup and then cruise at third and uh, i know that you know morgan got a nice couple of hits there yesterday and dylan got the ball got got you know some hits on him as well but just you know, what were your initial impressions, I guess, of that, that move? I definitely tried to avoid the answering that question before, didn't I, Glad You circled yeah. back around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're persistent, <laughs> like a good reporter would be. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I wanted to shake things up a little bit yesterday. And, um, uh, you know, um, I mean, I liked it the way it looked yesterday. Obviously, you know, I thought Trey did a great job. And Trey gives us a lot of the same qualities that Dylan gives us in the leadoff spot. I think he's an excellent hitter. So when the lineup turns over, you've got a good hitter waiting up there at the top. And, you know, I keep talking about the big base hit that he got with two outs. You know, it turned it into a double with hustle, but it was basically an RBI single up the middle with two outs. That was a huge run to give us the two-run lead. And then, of course, Drost ended up hitting the home run to, to extend the lead. But uh, so Trey gives us that, plus he's, he obviously can run. I think he's got, what, seven stolen bases for the year, something like that. So he, he's a fearless base runner. You know, he's he loves to try to steal bases, much like like Dylan does. He get, they get mad at me when I don't give them a steal sign. Those two guys, they're so confident in themselves. Um, and, and Dylan, obviously, would be a good three-hole hitter. You know, he, he has all the qualities. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, it's something that I'm going to consider going forward. You know, I think a lot has to do with who the pitcher is we're facing or what the conditions are. But I like the way it looked. And uh, – but I liked it the way it was before, too, you know. Um you know, uh, there, there's other reasons, and it's not does it's not related to Trey Morgan or Dylan Cruz. You know, there's other factors that go into how I put the lineup together as well that I'd rather not allude to right now. Some of them are positive, but some of them are not as positive. If you know what I'm saying. Anybody else? Where are you heading, yeah, Matt? One more. Yeah, sure. Well. Um, I was just curious, what, what, what did Collier need to do to kind of get himself into this position? Was there something that he was – like, what, why, why did it kind of take a little bit for him to get that opportunity? He, he – um, you know, he, Collier is a better game player than he is a practice player, which is the way you would rather have it as a coach, okay? But when you watch him in practice and, and he's not – you know, he's you know, not fielding balls consistently or he's making errant throws or he's not – you know, swinging good and batting practice, it's, it makes you hesitant to put him into the game, you know, but then you put him in the game and all of a sudden he takes his game to a different level. Uh, you know, the more, the more you're around him, you start to realize that's the way that he is. He did it last year. He wasn't a good in practice. And then you play him in the games and he plays pretty well. And then he comes back this year and he, he during the fall, he had a very poor fall, but then in the purple gold world series, he played really well. <laughs> and then and then you start the spring and you're thinking he's going to be a starting player and he doesn't play well at the preseason games and then you put him in the games and you see what he does so you start to think there's a trend there but you don't learn you, you have to learn this about players and and uh but he did have a good week of practice before I put him in you know we we had a we had some some sim at bats and he actually swung the bat really well against some pitchers that we wanted to get some work and, and 
he was really uh, bearing down in the field and, and looked good in the field. And it's no secret that we were struggling a little bit with our defense at second base. And uh, I figured, you know, that athletically, he brought a little bit more to the table from a range standpoint. And, you know, I thought it was worth a chance, you know. I almost played him against Southeastern Louisiana on Tuesday, but the wind was blowing out. I almost actually played him on the Sunday game against UTSA. And Eddie talked me out of it because uh, the wind was blowing out. And we played Zach instead. And Zach ended up hitting a home run and getting four hits. And Eddie was right. And then uh, I, w- I was going to play Collier on Tuesday against Southeastern. And Eddie talked me out of it again because the wind was blowing out. But this time, Zach didn't hit a home run and had a rough night uh, offensively. So I, you know, I, now I was concerned that I'm playing Collier against Mississippi State without giving him a non-conference game to kind of get his feet wet. But I figured, you know, the experience he had last year was enough, and I threw him in there anyway. And I, he just answered the bell. I thought he played great all weekend. If you guys don't mind, I'm going to run out to the field. We got a couple of pitchers that are rehabbing, and they're going to do a little sim game today. So I want to see how they're doing. Everybody got enough? Okay. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Coach.